Hi, this is Scott Lancer, the Director of Associates for Biblical Research, and I'm here with my colleague Henry Smith, and Henry and I are here today uh, on the second episode of Digging for Truth, and we are so excited to be here today to, to join with you and to share about the things of Scripture, the things of archaeology, and how archaeology upholds the Bible. Uh, Henry, welcome. Good to have you here with us today. Hey, it's great. It's great to be here together to talk about the wonderful world of uh, archaeology and the scriptures. Henry, uh, today we're going to be focusing on uh, King David, uh, man or myth. And of course, uh, when um, believers in Jesus, believers in the Bible, when they think about King David, they don't even have a, a thought that uh, King David might not have exist, existed. We assume he exists, but for those outside of the Bible who don't believe the Bible, there's a, a, a lot of skepticism yes. out there in the world. Uh, skepticism in the academic world, skepticism among people ev everyday life who just don't know that these things actually existed. Um, could you talk a little bit about uh, why we believe King David existed? Why is it important? that David existed, the, the David that is mentioned in the Bible. Yeah, that's right. Uh, David is, of course, a, the, the famous king of the Old Testament, the, the, the second king on the throne. He took place of Saul, right, uh, around 1000 BC. So we're talking about 1000 years before the coming of Jesus. And um, uh, he's, a, he's the most important figure in terms of kings in the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. So, and he is vital to the big picture of the Bible. So we have a couple of verses, uh, very, very easy uh, verses that are, that are mentioned in the Scripture. Uh, the first one we have is uh, 2 Samuel uh, verse 5-3. So David is anointed as king. The elders of Israel came to the king at Hebron, and King David made a covenant with them before the Lord, and they anointed David king over Israel. Mm -hmm. So we know that David has been anointed according to the Scriptures, right? Then we have a, an incredible promise that's given in 2 Samuel, and it says, a promise given by God, God is speaking to David, your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. So this is a prophecy uh, that's given in the Old Testament that not only establishes David's uh, kingship at that time, but it points to a future kingdom uh, that, that will come and a a, a greater king will come, and that king is Jesus who comes into the world, right, to establish his kingdom forever. So there's a direct connection, this is an important point, yes. direct connection between historical King David and King Jesus. Yeah, that's, that's exactly right. This is, uh, a lot of times uh, pe people struggle with the connection between their walk with Jesus Christ, Christians who love Jesus, and why are we talking about archaeology in the Bible, this stuff that happened in the Old Testament way back then? I, I, I want to walk with Jesus. I wanna, I wanna, I'm saved by Him. I've been, I've been delivered from my sins and so on. Uh, but the Bible connects Him to all of Scripture. And this, this figure of David who lived in history is vitally connected. Here we see a concrete example. The implication is so great for the gospel if David was not a real person. If he wasn't a real king in a real city of Jerusalem, he had a real kingdom and a real throne that's connected to the proclamation of Jesus coming to fulfill that promise that David was given. The implications for David not being real are enormous for the gospel. Yeah, yeah, and you know, it makes us wonder you know, what the motivations are of some skeptics. Because, right. see, in some cases, uh, you know, they're looking, they're, 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 they're speaking out of their scholarly academic backgrounds. They're right. saying, well, we have questions about historical David. But it, it does sometimes suggest that there, there could be a real worldview difference here. Yes, yes, it's definitely a worldview clash uh, where you have the, the Christian worldview, which is, the, which is found in the scriptures, right? It's articulated in the Bible. And then this other worldview. Part of that is the insistence that the archaeology, uh, what's recorded in the Bible, must be authenticated by archaeology. Mm -hmm. So if we don't have any evidence for David, concrete evidence, then we have to be skeptical about the text of the Bible. 
And this happens all the time in other, in other uh, areas of the Bible, but particularly when we're talking about David. We have to have, we must have separate evidence. The text is an ancient text that should stand on its own, uh, not just as the Word of God, but just as an ancient text that comes down to us from a very long time ago. Mm-hmm. So uh, it's a question of worldview. It's also a question of method and what, what is the structure of how these two things relate to one another. Yeah. Now, now some, some of the skeptics, uh, they're, they're going after no ev- evidence for David because for them, when they, they look in the Bible, well, first of all, they may not look in the Bible. Because uh, this goes back to this worldview clash, because for some, they dismiss the Bible as a religious text. It's non-historical. You shouldn't even look at it. Right. You should just only be looking for evidence uh, in archaeology. You know, how should we respond to that sort of issue? Yeah, uh, uh, there, you know, there's a, a number of things that I think as the church that we've, we've got to look at uh, where there's a worldview clash in terms of how we view uh, an ancient text and the kind of skepticism that's that's uh, put upon it. The Bible is treated as suspect, uh, so it's guilty before it's proven innocent, as opposed to the other way around. We would say, at minimum, that it ought to be given a fair hearing, because it is an ancient text, uh, and there's good reasons to treat it as historical. Uh, the other part of it is all writing from the ancient world has a worldview that's been intertwined with it. Mm-hmm. Other writings outside the Bible, they had other gods that they worshipped. And that theology informed the way that they wrote. Mm-hmm. Modern people are informed by their worldview and how they write and what they share. So the idea that the archaeologist is neutral and the Christian is not is a false argument. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. The secular person has their own worldview that informs the way they look at things, and mm-hmm. the Christian has a worldview that informs their way. And there's yeah. a worldview clash that goes on. So we've got to acknowledge that yeah. and then look at, at that. So it's, it's more than just evidence. Yeah. Uh, there's something that goes on that's deeper than that. That's right. And see, we're talking here about archaeology. We're talking about discoveries, and we're comparing, uh, we're, we're thinking about that, but now what you're discussing is the historical realities of David and yes. various people in the Bible. And uh, there's an inconsistency, it seems to me, in how all of this is discussed. And we can talk about that some more. Um, but, you know, the religious texts that the scholars investigate, they treat them with fairness. They come to the Bible, the Bible, like, like they'll quote all day long all these other religious texts and right. how they, they bring knowledge into the historical yes. pursuit. Um, but when it comes to the Bible, you're not allowed to do that. Now, we, we only have a, a, a little bit of time here in this segment, Henry. Yes. How can we address this whole issue of this unfairness as Christians? I think twofold. One is, I think we critique it at the worldview level. Point out how... Each worldview informs the way that evidence is looked at. And try to get people to be more uh, cognizant of it. And then Mm -hmm. second, actually talk about the evidence, which is what we're going to do in our next segment. Talk Mm -hmm. about actual discoveries that are sometimes ignored or dismissed. Okay. Well, we're talking about King David, man or myth. And we're talking about these large areas of... uh, investigation surrounding David, uh, the the philosophical approach to understanding history. Uh, But what we're really looking at is, you know, where where does the evidence take us? We know what the Bible says, but where does the evidence take us? And we'll talk about that when we come back. Welcome back to Digging for Truth, and I'm Scott Lancer with my friend and colleague Henry Smith, and we're talking today about King David. Was David a historical figure? Uh, Ultimately, the question is, can we trust our Bible? And of course, we are proclaiming very loudly that yes, indeed, we can trust the Bible because it is the Word of God. But the archaeological evidence uh, strongly affirms David's existence as well. Uh, But we're talking about some of the criticism and the critiques of David being a historical person. Um, Henry, um, one of the arguments that's made about David is that he's, uh, he's really a, a fictitious person. Yes. Um, how, how would you address that uh, 
statement. Yeah, as I talked about in the previous segment, the first way I would address it is uh, challenging the idea that we should not take the biblical text seriously. So that's at one level, you would challenge it. You would say, um, I don't accept the idea that you must have archeology span to support what's in the ancient text. So that would be the first way. Then the second way would be to actually talk about evidences that have been found that actually affirm David. Before we do that, let's just show a couple of quotes, standard kind of quotes that you can find. You just go out into Google search and you can find this. Here's King David is fictitious. There could not have been a united monarchy with the Saul or David or Solomon in Jerusalem during the 10th century BC. That's a thousand years before the time of Jesus and this is fairly typical. Um, or that his reign is exaggerated. So we have, you know, it's highly unlikely that David ever conquered territories of people more than a day or two march from the heartland of Judah. We will suggest that Solomon's Jerusalem was not extensive or impressive, and so on. Uh, these are very standard, typical viewpoints of many scholars, liberal, critical scholars uh, in the academic world as it relates to David. Now, um, but there are some evidences that have been found, some incredible evidences that actually mention David that are either dismissed or rationalized around, but in my view, they're very clear. Yeah, now, now Henry, th you just read a couple of quotes here yes. from some um, fairly well-known, established scholars, Correct. critical scholars. Right. Now, th this kind of approach uh, people might say who are who are viewing this show today that they're, they're going to say, well, maybe this doesn't affect us. Maybe maybe this is just the, in those you know lofty positions of the academic world. Right. But the reality of it is that these arguments filter their way down into our culture. They show up on popular uh, cable television shows. Absolutely. Uh, there's lots of different uh, cable shows that are dealing with topics related to the. Uh, to the Bible and to its history, so and, and it eventually finds its way all the way down into the church. So why should we take these issues seriously? Yeah, you're exactly right. That's exactly what happens. It 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 makes its way on popular TV programs, so people watch them. And if they they don't have enough knowledge of the subject, uh, they're they're not sure how to grapple with it. Now, a lot of times, intuitively, Christians will say that well, that doesn't sound right, and that often is the leading of the Holy Spirit, or their their own knowledge of the scriptures, and that's a good thing. Uh, but that is not always the case. Uh, this stuff can lead people astray, lead them away from the gospel, lead them away from the scriptures. Uh, and also it's made its ways into the seminaries. Uh, we, yeah. We've seen in our experience uh, established Christian seminaries where these ideas make their way into it and then begin to affect the teaching. In seminaries, pastors are trained. So this is a very serious problem. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, one that we have to confront with gentleness and respect, of course, right? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. um, let's talk about a little bit about one discovery that mentions David on it, mm -hmm. the Tell Dan Stila. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. um, we'll see on the screen here, here's a discovery that was found in the early 1990s, and it mentions on it the House of David, written in the ancient Aramaic script, mentions the house of David. Now it's from about 150 years after the time of David. Mm -hmm. So what's really interesting about it uh, in, in this respect is this stone, if you want to call it that, inscription, is uh, a victory inscription from a king from Aram, mm -hmm. where we get the word Aramaic. Uh, the Aramaic kingdom is mentioned in the Bible in various places in the conflicts that they had with Israel. Mm -hmm. So this king is declaring victory over the king of Israel. Now, at that time, it's not David. It's 150 years later. Mm -hmm. And it says, House of David. So I defeated the king of Israel, the house of David. So here we have an enemy of Israel acknowledging that the king that he defeated, allegedly in battle, is of the lineage of David. Mm -hmm. If you want to say he's a hostile witness, He's not defending Israel by any stretch. He wants to defeat Israel. Mm -hmm. And he's referring to the king as the house of David. So not only does it mention David, but it's an extraordinary acknowledgement by the enemies of Israel that the current king is descended from King David. Yeah, yeah. That's, uh, it's it's a, an amazing, an amazing uh, discovery, the Tel Dan Stila. 
Um, uh, you know, I, I think about some of these discoveries, and some people say, well, okay, that's just one discovery. They sometimes set the whole, the weight of the scholarly community against these discoveries. Why yes. is a discovery like this so significant? Yeah, you look at the, that, and there's another one we're going to talk about in the next segment uh, called the Moabite Stone. It's an extraordinary discovery. It also mentions David, but we'll, we'll save that for then. Mm -hmm. um, there's always a conflict about the interpretation of these things. So, so the scholars are debating the inscription. It says House of David. It's pretty clear that that's, that's what it says. You know, one scholar says, no, it says, um, uh, it's not David, it's un the word for uncle. Yeah. So in the context, yeah. you read it, you say, I, de I defeated the king of Israel, the house of uncle. Now we can see the sort of absurdity of that in the context. And there are other absurd yes. Uh, yes. interpretations. The house of kettle. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. So these are, these are the, the lengths that sometimes critics will go to to try to get around um, the evidence as it, as it stands. It's pretty clear secular and Christian scholars have examined it. It says house of David. And uh, yeah. Yeah. It's, pretty, it's pretty, unlike the Isaiah seal that we shared in a previous episode, this is more of a slam dunk. Yeah, see, uh, you know, for all the vaunted objectivity that sometimes scholars project, sometimes you see some of the most ridiculous efforts yes. to avoid what seems to be painfully obvious yes. in the evidence. You know, um, we don't have an enormous amount of discoveries that mention David or the house of David, but we have some very important finds. And as we move into our next segment, we're going to talk about them. But it, it is amazing, isn't it, that there is a resistance to want the Bible to have credibility. That's the thing that I observe more than anything else. Yes. They, they do not want the Bible to have credibility because of the spiritual message of the Bible. Yes. We have a few seconds here. What, what are your uh, No, I was just going to say, the, the, in the Christian worldview, says that man without Christ is trying to escape from God. And that's a spiritual reality that scholars also deal with. Very good. Very good, Henry. Well, we'll be back in just a, a minute to uh, continue this interesting conversation about, the, uh, about David, man or myth, and of course, we believe that the scriptures have told us exactly who David is, and that he indeed existed and lived, and the kingdom of David is very, very real. We'll be right back. Hi, we're back once again uh, with Digging for Truth, and I'm here with my uh, friend and colleague, Henry Smith, and we're talking about King David. We're talking about whether or not David actually existed, and of course, um, we believe that he, that he certainly did and that he was a historical figure. But we're going to talk some more about the evidence that upholds and supports the fact of David's historicity. So, uh, Henry, there's a, a very important discovery that was made uh, called the Moabite Stone, also known as the Misha Stila. Um, could you tell us about how this uh, connects with our discussion about David? Yeah, we talked in the, in the last segment about the Tel Dan Stila, which mentions the House of David in it, right? It's, a, it's an inscription written by a foreign king uh, from uh, Aram. Here we have another uh, incredible discovery. This is from the 19th century, actually, uh, called the Moabite Stone. It's written by the king of Moab, Mesha, who's mentioned in the Bible. And so this is uh, his perspective of the events recorded in 2 Kings 3. So in 2 Kings 3, you have the biblical perspective, the perspective of Israel, and here you have the same events being recorded in this stone, mm -hmm. giving his perspective, his twist on the conflict that was yes. taking place at that time. It's quite extraordinary. If you look at the picture on the screen, you can see that you can see where it's been broken. And what's interesting is, just as, as a funny aside, the Bedouins who had, had found this thought they could get more money from the archaeologists, yeah. so they smashed yeah. it to pieces thinking yeah. that they could... They, they could um, <clears throat> Uh, get more money for it's really really yes. kind of funny. They misunderstood yes. uh, how, how incredible this discovery is. Yeah. But um, beyond that that sort of funny story, not only does this uh, in incredible discovery mention the house of David, like the Tel Dan steal it, mm -hmm. but it also mentions other uh, things in the Bible that uh, are confirmed in the stone. It mentions Omri, king of Israel, okay, one of the kings uh, during the divided kingdom period. 
Incredibly, it mentions the name Yahweh, yeah. the covenant, yeah. the personal name that God revealed to Moses at the burning bush, Yahweh. So here we have uh, the people of Moab, the king of Moab knows who the God is that the Israelites worship, or at least are supposed to worship, right? Mm -hmm. So we have the covenant name of Yahweh. Of course, we have Mesha, king of Moab, right, mentioned in the stone. We have his God, Shemosh, or Chemosh, mentioned mm -hmm. 11 times. Quite extraordinary. Chemosh is mentioned in the Bible. Mm -hmm. So the biblical authors were familiar with this God that the Moabites worshipped. Mm -hmm. So you see a contemporary uh, authorship of the biblical account, not written centuries later. And this is an important thing, Scott, right? Mm -hmm. We often hear, we, we talked about programs before, <coughs> like the History Channel and that kind of thing. So often, they will say, the biblical accounts were written centuries, supposedly after they took place, usually during the Babylonian exile. Mm -hmm. But really, that's, that's impossible in many ways. Because here you have the biblical author talking about a Moabite god. Mm -hmm. Centuries later, there's no way they could have known that. It would have been beyond their knowledge. Yeah. Now, beyond that, it also mentions the tribe of Gad, mm -hmm. which is one of the tribes of Israel, the 12 tribes of Israel. So that's mentioned in the stone. And something quite graphic and horrific is mentioned in the stone, and that is that the king of Moab sacrifices his own son yeah. to his God because of what's happening in terms of this battle. Very gruesome but extraordinary. And of course, child sacrifice is mentioned in the Bible and yeah. recorded in the Bible and forbidden by Yahweh for the Israelites to engage in that practice. Yes. Now, I know that's a lot. Of, that's a mouthful of stuff I just shared. But it just shows you one discovery yeah. has all of this material in it that affirms the scriptures. And of course, what we're talking about is back to the house of David. Right. Once again, right. a foreign king saying, the house of David. Yeah. I defeated the house of David. Yeah. Uh, the Meshastila is extraordinary because it is so, has so much information. And, it, and the whole story of it being broken into pieces and then you know, parts of it were restored and yes. then other parts they took, uh, you know, they impressions of it and anyway, fortunately they took impressions before that was broken by the bedouins yes yeah it yeah. is extraordinary that it's all come back together it's a very important find yes. well all this relates back to david and uh, just briefly uh, let's talk a little bit about just jerusalem obviously it's david's city um, yes maybe we could talk just about that and its importance yeah, very briefly, I mean, uh, there's uh, uh, Elot Mazar, the archaeologist, is, is digging there in, in Jerusalem, and she has found a, a large structure that she <coughs> believes is David's palace. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so it could be David's palace. We're not 100% sure about that. But it's a very significant find because it's in the right place at the right time. And uh, you can see this drawing on the screen of, this, of the city of, of David, how it may have looked in the, in the ancient time. What's interesting about it is you see the couple of hills. Here's another uh, piece from the Bible. Jerusalem is written in a, it's not a singular text, but it's dual, like Elohim is. It has a, mm -hmm. a multiplicity of some kind in it. Mm -hmm. And that's probably because of the multiple hills that Jerusalem consists of. It's very, very fascinating. But her excavations in the city of David are quite interesting. And uh, it's possible that she has found David's palace. Right place, right time. Yeah, yeah, very exciting. And uh, she's uh, digging at the Ophel. She's been involved in a number of important yes. discoveries. Um, we, uh, uh, there's a lot of lines of evidence to do with Jerusalem connect connecting it to David. And uh, hopefully in a future episode of Digging for Truth, we're going to be able to get into that in more detail. Yes. Because the yes. evidence is quite extraordinary yes. for in support of King David and poor, uh, in, in, in support of um, uh, Solomon, uh, David's son Solomon and, and his kingdom. And all of the, the entire um, uh, historical um, history of the kings yes. and the monarchy. That's we'll right. Call the monarchy. So we're Looking gonna be, forward to that. Yes, we, 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 are, we, we really are. Now, we're, we're down to the last minute here, uh, Henry. How, how can we wrap up our discussion? Well, we're going to put a scripture on the, on the screen, and I'm just going to hit the highlights real quick of it, how important David is. Here from Acts chapter 2. Uh, Peter speaks, he says, first of all, that David is dead. 
-hmm. that Jesus is alive, mm -hmm. that Jesus has been resurrected from the dead, mm -hmm. but that Jesus, that P David wrote about mm -hmm. Jesus, mm -hmm. predicted his coming and his sitting on his throne, and mm -hmm. that there was great confidence. We have seen the resurrected Jesus. Mm -hmm. Peter and the apostles witnessed the resurrected Christ. This is an important dimension of how the Bible presents the gospel and how mm -hmm. important David is to it. Amen. Well, we're so glad you were with us today to uh, join, with, join us in this important discussion at Digging for Truth. We're so excited that you could be here, and we're looking forward to what God will do in, uh, as we share together about the things of Scripture and the Word of God. Thank you so much. <music>